name is Ted Hunt. I am Chief Trial Attorney at the Jackson County Prosecutor's Office in Kansas City and have been involved in DNA-related issues since the early 1990s. This panel is going to discuss various topics of post-conviction practice. Uh, primarily, we're going to focus on issues of access to evidence and also perspectives on case review and procedures and policies as it relates to case review. We're going to go in order of the layout in the manual. We have three panelists here today, Hoy Dow of the Innocence Project in New York, David Rodovsky, an attorney and professor at Pennsylvania, is that correct? And Michael Ware of the Dallas District Attorney's Office. They're going to talk about their perspectives on post-conviction DNA access to evidence and case review. And without further ado, Hoy, the mic is yours. Good morning. Uh, my name's Hui Dao, and I'm the case director at the Innocence Project, and I've been asked to speak about uh, our case evaluation process, uh, which I hope will be uh, useful to those of you who have to um, create, or as in our case, jerry-rig a process uh, to, to handle claims of innocence. Uh, since 1997, uh, I have, and now uh, a Department of Nine, has been evaluating uh, innocence claims of defendants who write to us um, to see if post-conviction DNA testing can prove innocence. Uh, and while the mandate as written is very simple, it's become much more complicated in practice uh, by uh, many factors, of uh, some of which I'll discuss uh, in, in the next couple moments. Briefly about the Innocence Project, uh, because we are solely focused on cases uh, of post-conviction DNA testing um, and innocence, uh, we can work nationally. Um, and because we do work nationally and because we started this work before many uh, of the statutes that were discussed earlier today were, uh, were created, uh, we don't have a statute-specific outlook in the evaluation process to determine uh, who, who our clients will be. Um, although that approach may be more applicable uh, to those of you who are working in, uh, within geographical uh, bounds. Uh, and so the, the assumptions that we uh, make during the evaluation process are that there might not be a statute that applies at all. Um, and uh, secondly, if, if the evidence in the case was collected in the first place, we assume that it may still exist. Um, and that is, we can't make the defendants prove that the evidence still exists before accept, uh, accepting their cases. That, in fact, informs a, a lot of the litigation that goes on after a case is accepted um, at the Innocence Project. Uh, briefly, we, uh, in the evaluation department, uh, employ a three-step process um, uh, to evaluate innocence claims. The first is uh, the claim that is presented by the defendant. Um, or by their advocates, um, and that is simply the letter that comes in or the package of documents that comes in where someone says, I'm innocent, DNA testing can prove it, um, and, and we take it from there. Uh, we have designed and refined a questionnaire, um, and most innocence projects uh, that, that you'll talk to have their own version of it, um, which asks more specific questions uh, about the facts of the case mo uh, mainly, uh, and specific claims, procedural history, uh, and other factors that, that go into evaluation. And the final step is to actually uh, collect the documents and the records or ask the hard questions of the defendants um, that will uh, either back up their claim or not. At any one of these stages, um, d defendants' cases are either passed on to the next stage or rejected. And finally, uh, after a case, and, and every case that gets to that third stage, um, is worked up. We have everything in writing and, and cited, and then that goes to a case meeting uh, where the Innocence Project attorneys uh, and the evaluators all get in the same room and, uh, by a consensus model, uh, figure out, A, if the case meets the mandate, um, and B, if the, if the claim of innocence is viable. Um, now, again, all of that sounds pretty simple on paper. Uh, but many factors uh, pre present many challenges to case evaluation. Um, the first, which is not often discussed, is at the actual human resources element of looking at these cases. Over the last 15 years, we, as a, as a project, have evaluated over 30,000 cases. Um, and that means you have to find people who uh, are willingly taking jobs where they are um, 
well, your job is to spend all day reading about crime, uh, about victims, about uh, rapes, murders, putting yourself in, in all of the respective positions in a case. Um, and so, you know, training is one, burnout is another. And, and with specific regard to post-conviction DNA testing, very many disparate uh, knowledge bases that, that the evaluators have to have. That is, you have to know enough about the science, you do have to know enough about the law, um, and untrainable things um, like uh, how do you deal with uh, people, for example, who can't communicate because they are illiterate? Um, what, what do you do with a claim of innocence if it's in another language? Um, the relative lucidity of, of the people uh, writing in, many mental illness, uh, me mental illnesses to deal with, and, and so all of these things cloud the, the simple issue of innocence or guilt and whether or not post-conviction DNA can prove that. There are also many procedural challenges to, uh, to doing casework, um, most stemming from the ages of the cases. Uh, obviously, most of our cases, uh, defendants writing in, um, are writing in because they were convicted before DNA testing was even an option at the trial level. Um, and every jurisdiction uh, has their own rules about how records are kept, how long they're kept, when they can be destroyed. Um, and then you also have uh, just procedural problems of, well, there is no real record on the facts in many cases when someone pleads guilty. Um, so ferreting out those claims um, and backing them up uh, to the point where you're going to represent somebody on a claim of innocence uh, and present that in court um, is actually a pretty complicated matter and uh, quite often takes years just to get that information to back up the uh, you know, initial claim, which is just a letter that says, I'm innocent, please help me. Um, and because we don't have the answers to those questions or because the, the solutions that we have implemented have been um, less than perfect, uh, there is now, uh, at least with us, an issue of backlogs um, in case evaluation. Uh, if DNA testing had remained where it was in 1997 when I started, our jobs would be a lot easier. But with every new ex uh, exoneration, we have had to learn new lessons that then uh, apply to the evaluation process as well. Um, and uh, the ones I want to highlight today are the expanding possibilities of DNA testing itself um, and what we've learned from the cases that are outside the obvious cases. What I mean by obvious cases um, are, it, it was no coincidence that, that the first many exonerations all had an element of sexual assault uh, in them because it just happens to be the crime where it's most likely that probative biological evidence is left behind by a perpetrator. Um, However, new developments in technology, in DNA technology, have meant new possibilities for testing and getting um, useful results, which means that not only do we have to review new claims now, we also have to review cases that we had rejected in the past. Um, and it also means for, for my department in evaluation that there are fewer and fewer cases that we can reject just by type, uh, that is, what class of crime it is. Um, and, and likelihood of, um, judging likelihood of, of biological evidence um, being left behind by a perpetrator or carried away by, by the perpetrator um, is, is a consideration that has become much more complicated. Um, for example, uh, in, in the past, uh, certain types of results were not available to us and did not become, become part of the formulation of evaluation, things like uh, habitual wear testing for clothing that is collected, uh, touch DNA on that same kind of evidence. Um, you know, carjacking used to be pretty much a case we couldn't take, but uh, at this day and age, if you're swabbing the steering wheel, not only for, uh, for fingerprints, but also for uh, sweat or skin cells left behind by a perpetrator, all of these, uh, all of these things complicate uh, what kind of cases we take, and we now have to look at everything. Um, the, the advent of new technologies in, uh, in DNA as well um, mean that you now have an arsenal of tests that could prove um, either individually or combined with each other many different results. And so you have to weigh, well, what would mito, mitochondrial testing do in this case? Is there a possibility to use YSTR uh, to shed more light on fingernail scrapings, um, for example? And so uh, the new possibilities for testing mean that we now have many new applications for the results. Um, and the ones I'd like to highlight are um, and what we have to consider now in every case is redundancy. And by that I mean cases where the results on any individual piece of evidence may not exonerate by itself, 
but in combination would, uh, would paint a, a pretty clear picture uh, of what happened um, factually. Uh, for example, if you have uh, a case in which a hat was allegedly left behind by a perpetrator, but you're in a public setting, uh, the profile off that hat may not be enough to exonerate. But if the, the profile on the hat also matches the profile of, the perp, uh, of, a, of a person underneath the victim's fingernails and onto, onto the knife handle that was left behind and determined to be a murder weapon, certainly now you have a much clearer picture of what happened. Um, the, and so redundancy is, is a huge factor now in, um, in, in evaluating cases. Uh, the advent uh, or the use of uh, DNA databases has also complicated the evaluation process um, because now we have to ask also, okay, if, if an exclusion is not enough, what about identifying uh, the actual perpetrator uh, if there's just not just an exclusion to deal with, um, either by testing alternate suspects um, or uh, by running, running uh, the profile through a database, or any combination of the two. Um, and so good things like exonerations and uh, new DNA testing technologies have actually, on the evaluation end, um, led to many factors that complicate my job. Um, so again, to review, there are very few now automatic rejections that we have by case type uh, or crime type, uh, given everything that's getting swabbed these days. And there are very few uh, automatic rejections by uh, factors uh, of conviction. Um, what the DNA exonerations have taught us is that, well, we do, we do have to look at cases uh, where there are confessions, where there are multiple IDs. Um, and especially now, uh, of concern to me, are cases that were either closed or rejected in the past because the technology did not exist um, at the time. Uh, and just briefly, uh, as I said before, uh, in our 15-year history, we've looked at now over 30,000 cases. Um, and people are always interested in, in our numbers, and I don't know that they're that indicative because we do work on a national uh, scale. Uh, they're not maybe useful for, for those of you who, who don't. There are very few organizations that do. Um, but uh, we currently have over 8,000 cases in evaluation in one of the first three stages uh, that, that I talked about. But we have rejected over 22,000 cases already. Again, that's over a 15-year span. And when I started in 1997, I thought, well, science, it's going to develop, it's going to be uh, integrated into the criminal justice system, and I'll be out of a job in 10 years. Um, but our numbers have belied that. Um, and uh, in fact, in 2005, the average number of new requests that we were receiving uh, on a month-to-month -month basis was 181. Uh, last year's uh, average monthly intake um, was uh, over 267 uh, cases every month. Um, and we are, uh, we are dedicated to looking at every one of those claims at, at, at some level. Um, and so there's a, there's a large task before us. Um, but we already know that innocent people are in prison and that for a select few, um, science can write those wrongs. And, and that's why I'm here today. That's why you're here today. Um, the Innocence Project evaluates on the potential uh, for results to clarify that situation, though obviously there are a few guarantees. Um, and what happens after the case starts being litigated and the test results come in is a question I'm not going to address here, but obviously um, uh, complicate the landscape. So how do we find the, these cases when we've learned that the measure of innocence in these cases, that is the DNA testing and the science, reveals the fallibility of the very social factors that, go, that lead into the conviction in the first place? Um, I wish there was a better answer, but so far we've got our hands full hoping that those people will find us. Thanks. Good morning, and thanks for the invitation to talk. Uh, I'm going to speak uh, about a, uh, a separate issue. We, we've heard so far through the stories this morning and the panel discussions uh, uh, the ways in which DNA testing uh, may proceed post-conviction. Uh, the Cotton case, uh, apparently a case where the prosecutor and the police agreed upon the request of defense counsel, Mr. Cotton, to uh, have the uh, DNA tested uh, post-conviction. There are, as you've heard, statutes now in some 46 states um, 
which allow for post-conviction uh, testing under certain circumstances, and those statutes uh, vary under the conditions that the uh, defendant has to meet and what the defendant may have to prove uh, to get access to the DNA uh, post-conviction. Um, uh, what I have focused on in, in some of my work and writing and, uh, and litigation uh, is on the problem when there is no statute, uh, when there is no agreement by the prosecutor or police to uh, test, or where the statute uh, may not permit testing under the particular facts of the case. And uh, uh, that presents the question. Uh, currently now before the Supreme Court of the United States, they've taken certiorari on a uh, case from the Ninth Circuit, a case called Osborne, currently being briefed. Some of the litigants' lawyers are here today, I think both from Alaska and from the Innocence Project, who are litigating that case. That presents squarely the question to the Supreme Court whether there is a constitutional right to post-conviction DNA testing, putting aside statutes, putting aside agreement. If we don't have that, uh, does a defendant uh, who's been convicted at trial now discovers that there's biological evidence that could prove innocence, does that person have a constitutional right to access to that evidence post-conviction? Uh, my introduction uh, to that problem uh, came about uh, 10 years ago in connection with the Innocence Project. I got a call from the Innocence Project. I, practice in Philadelphia. Uh, they had a request from a uh, young man in prison in Pennsylvania, a man named Bruce Godshalk, uh, who had been convicted of two rapes in 1987 uh, in a suburban county outside of Philadelphia, uh, had gotten a 10 to 20 year sentence. Uh, he had um, found out after the trial, and in fact there was introduction of evidence at trial of biological evidence. There was no DNA testing at that time. It was uh, blood typing. Um, but the, uh, there was uh, uh, biological evidence from both rapes, and the theory was the same person committed both rapes. Everybody agreed on that. Uh, this was a serial rapist, uh, and in fact, there had been four sexual assaults over a uh, short period of time. Um, uh, Gottschalk had maintained his innocence, um, notwithstanding the fact uh, that the police had a taped confession from him. Uh, they had identification uh, witnesses from both cases. Um, they had a uh, composite sketch uh, that looked very much like him, uh, and they had testimony from a jailhouse informer uh, who said that he confessed uh, while in jail awaiting trial. Uh, uh, on the other hand, there was this biological evidence uh, sitting there, we thought, uh, that we'd like to test. Um, uh, I read the transcript. I said to myself, probably guilty. Confession in which he gave details of the crime that only the police and the victim would know. Um, identification testimony, as I said, jailhouse testimony, uh, and a composite that looked like him. Um, uh, so the uh, first step was to contact the district attorney of the county, and contrary to what you've heard so far today, where it seems like there's often agreement on testing, uh, we had one of these conversations which was like between Venus and Mars. Um, uh, I said, would you allow us to test that evidence, or would you test it? We'll pay for it through the Innocence Project. Uh, we can select laboratories. We can split the evidence any way you want to do it. Uh, no, we won't. Do you have the evidence? Yes, we do. We have both biological evidence from both cases. Um, why won't you test it? A jury found him guilty. He confessed, we're not going to test. Um, uh, that conversation went on for a few months. We couldn't reach agreement. And so from our side, we were stuck. Uh, uh, Godshalk had already been to state court to seek access to the evidence. There was some common law developments in Pennsylvania that allowed access, but only in cases where the evidence was not overwhelming. Uh, this was a case where at least plausibly you could say the evidence was overwhelming. Uh, so he had been denied relief in the state courts, and the only other possibility would be to go to federal court to seek relief. Habeas corpus, which is one possibility, uh, was out of the question for a variety of procedural reasons, uh, time limitations, the fact that we had no proof that there was a constitutional violation. We had a step to fill in. Uh, sure, he might be innocent, but we couldn't prove it uh, without the DNA, and there was no theory under habeas corpus jurisprudence where we could go to federal court and seek relief. And so we devised on a method, on a, on a theory, uh, that we first presented. There was a the first case in which this was uh, uh, fully briefed and, uh, uh, and litigated uh, under the civil rights statute to go in civilly, uh, to sue under Section 1983, which is the major federal civil rights statute, uh, asserting that there was a constitutional right to access to evidence post-conviction. Um, now, when you think about it, for those of you who not necessarily practice the 1983 area, but think about the principles of criminal procedure uh, that might give you a theory there, uh, the one that struck us as probably the strongest 
uh, was the whole line of Brady cases, uh, access to exculpatory evidence. Uh, the problem was uh, Brady seemed to be limited, or at least arguably was limited, to the trial stage. A uh, defendant before trial is entitled to exculpatory evidence or possibly exculpatory evidence. Biological evidence might fit that, uh, but no court had yet addressed the question post-conviction, does that kind of broad Brady principle apply? Uh, another theory was simply access to the courts. Uh, there's a body of uh, constitutional law that enables uh, prisoners particularly to get access to the courts. The state can't arbitrarily prevent access to the courts. Uh, that was another theory. Um, and so we, we, we put together a number of theories to argue that uh, Mr. Gottschalk was entitled to post-conviction access uh, to the DNA evidence. Uh, uh, that was brief, that was argued before a federal district judge in, uh, in Philadelphia, and in 2001, uh, that judge agreed with us um, under a broad due process principle uh, and allowed us to get access to the evidence. Uh, we then agreed with the district attorney that we would divide, literally physically divide the evidence. They would send it to their lab, we sent it to our lab. Uh, that was done. Um, and I still remember the day um, a couple of months later when uh, Peter Neufeld called me. He said, you're sitting down. I said, I'm sitting down. Uh, he said, God chalk is innocent. Um, the DNA was the same from both rapes, and he was 100% excluded um, uh, from, uh, 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 from, from, from being guilty. Um, so uh, that was uh, obviously a fairly remarkable result. Uh, uh, other people will talk probably over the couple of days of, of this question of why did he confess? Uh, they had a full confession with, uh, 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 with details of the crime. As it turned out, uh, he confessed because the detectives, who were quite sure of his guilt by the time they interrogated him, uh, convinced him it was his, in his best interest to confess, fed him the details. Uh, the camera and the, uh, the audio wasn't on at that time. Finally, during the uh, formal confession, uh, uh, he was able to uh, parrot back the details of the, uh, uh, of the various uh, rapes. Turns out there were problems with the uh, uh, eyewitness identification also because following the exoneration, uh, there was actually civil litigation uh, for damages, uh, which was successful against uh, the detectives in the county that, w that was involved. Um, but the, the critical point was, uh, uh, was whether this principle, uh, this constitutional principle, which was recognized at least by the federal district judge uh, in Philadelphia in, in, uh, in 2001, uh, would be applied across the country. And uh, as you might guess, there was a division in the courts um, over the past uh, now eight or nine years on that question. Um, in several jurisdictions, uh, there are uh, decisions out of the Fifth Circuit, out of the Eleventh Circuit, out of a number of circuits, including the Ninth now, um, on the question of whether or not the Constitution actually provides that right. Um, uh, when a defendant says, this evidence, which I don't have access to, could prove my innocence, um, could prove factual innocence, is there a constitutional obligation on the police or the district attorney, whoever may have that evidence, to actually disclose it? Uh, that, dis that issue has split the lower courts. It gets complicated not only on the substantive question that I, I present, this whole question of whether due process uh, uh, permits uh, a defendant to get that evidence. There are procedural obstacles uh, uh, for plaintiffs who try to do it. 1983 litigation uh, uh, is very complicated uh, uh, by procedural bars. Um, number of cases, and in fact, the case before the Supreme Court uh, uh, involves an issue aside from the merits of the case, whether you're entitled, uh, whether or not procedurally, 1983 is even an avenue that a plaintiff can use to try to get this evidence. Um, it's whole, this whole intersection between constitutional doctrine, uh, civil rights law, and habeas corpus uh, uh, jurisprudence that makes this very difficult. The court could actually duck this issue uh, and say that he's simply not entitled to go to court in the first place putting aside whether he has a constitutional right. My guess is the court will reach the, uh, uh, the substantive issue. As I say, that's going to be argued. Uh, uh, this term will have a decision by the end of June, uh, and it has very broad implications, obviously, uh, uh, for the criminal justice system as to how the court rules in this case. A lot of avenues they, uh, the court can take, um, because the uh, field, while it's become occupied now, uh, as you've heard this morning, uh, by statutes, we've had you know statutes now in uh, 46 states over the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, a number of those statutes don't permit or um, don't mandate a testing under certain circumstances. For example, uh, in Pennsylvania, which has a statute uh, uh, that was passed in the last uh, eight or nine years uh, for post-conviction DNA testing, uh, there is a provision that testing is only permitted in cases in which the testing will actually prove innocence. Uh, 
Uh, that provision has been interpreted by the courts of Pennsylvania to date to mean that someone who has confessed or pled guilty isn't entitled to post-conviction DNA testing. Uh, under that statute, Bruce Gottschalk uh, wouldn't have gotten into court because the police had a full tape confession uh, to the crime. So uh, the backup, the constitutional backup, um, uh, if there is one, is, is very significant. It will fill in the gaps where the statutes don't cover. Uh, and it was also important, obviously, in those few states, including Alaska, the four, three or four states now that are left, uh, that don't have statutes that, uh, that permit uh, uh, post-conviction uh, testing. So um, uh, all those are uh, obviously very, very important issues um, of concern to the court, um, and Alaska argues, and with amicus support from the United States and some states, but not all states, uh, is that this will expand due process beyond what it was intended to do, um, that due process protections are really only applicable during the trial process uh, to ensure the integrity of the trial, once there's a conviction, uh, there's very limited due process uh, review that should be permitted. Uh, obviously, the petitioner's argument is different, uh, that if Brady means anything, uh, if we've got a gold standard in terms of determining guilt or innocence, which DNA evidence seems to be, uh, and with the DNA, in, in fact, as, as, uh, as in this case, can actually prove guilt or innocence, uh, then the question of due process ought to incorporate, or the notion of due process, or to include and incorporate uh, the right to post DNA testing. Uh, we'll see. Uh, you'll, you'll be able to access the briefs and, uh, and other material uh, uh, that'll be presented to the court that'll be argued, I think, in probably March or April. Uh, and we'll have a decision by the end of June. We'll see what happens with that. Thanks. Good morning. It's, uh, it's really an honor to be asked to be a part of this panel. Uh, my name is Mike Ware. I'm with the Dallas County District Attorney's Office. And uh, I know we're running a little bit short of time, so I'm going to cut it short a little bit uh, and open it up to questions. But I'll be around until tomorrow afternoon. So if anybody has any questions they want to talk to me one-on-one -on -one about, I'll be, I'll be around and glad to answer them. Uh, I'm head of the Conviction Integrity Unit with the Dallas County District Attorney's Office, which is kind of a new term, and uh, I think it was coined by the first assistant uh, we have in Dallas County, Terry Moore. And just by way of a little, a little bit of background briefly, the way that came about was that in 2006, November of 2006, uh, Craig Watkins, uh, was elected district attorney of Dallas County. He was uh, kind of an outsider in that he had never been in the district attorney's office before, never served as a prosecutor, uh, and was running against a de facto incumbent uh, who had outspent him 10 to 1. And he ran on a platform of some fresh ideas, some of them kind of different for a district attorney to run on. Uh, he ran on being smart on crime. He ran on uh, a number of things other than uh, simply lock them up and throw away the key. Although uh, Mr. Watkins is very strong on law enforcement, that was not the only message he was trying to send in his campaign. In any event, he was elected and took office uh, the 1st of January 2007. And with his fresh ideas, one of the things he started looking at was that at that point, at the time he took office, Dallas County had uh, nine DNA exonerations. Those were nine exonerations that uh, uh, nobody disputed. The uh, uh, wrong person had been convicted of a crime that had been committed by someone else. And uh, he started looking at that, and he. he took that situation very seriously and thought it ought to be addressed. And the way he addressed it, or one way he addressed it, is to approach the Dallas County Commissioners, which is a very contentious political group, and engage them in a contentious discussion uh, about funding for positions that would become the Conviction Integrity Unit to, among other things, look into um, what Dallas County had been doing and to uh, uh, try to correct some of the problems of the past. Um, 
eventually, well, at the time that he approached them, which was in the spring of 2007, the DNA exonerations were up to 12. Uh, but what was perhaps more interesting than that is, is that uh, since the DNA post-conviction statute was enacted in 2001, Dallas County had had, by anybody's count, well over 400 applications for post-conviction DNA testing. Dallas County at that point had taken a pretty traditional approach towards that and, and resisted DNA testing if the statute could somehow be interpreted in a way that would deny it. And for the most part, the, the trial courts, the courts of convictions, and the courts of appeals, for the most part, went along with that. So of the more than 400 applications, 35 had actually received tests by, uh, at least on paper, by trial judges. And of those 35, 12 had come back confirmed guilty, 12 had come back exonerated, and, and the rest were inconclusive or in other categories. That being the case, once, um, or the, the proposal and what has become our biggest task, biggest single task with the Conviction Integrity Unit is to go back through the over 400 cases um, where the inmate had asked for a test, declared their innocence in some shape, form, or fashion, sometimes in a very informal fashion, but yet had been denied a test, to go back through those in a collaborative effort, um, and I think this is unprecedented, with uh, the Innocence Project of Texas um, and, and with some of the other Innocence Projects uh, around the state and, and with Michelle Moore with the Public Defender's Office, to go back through those cases um, with the free labor of students and, and with now with grant funds and determine if whether or not uh, among those cases were some instances where the inmate asked for a test and up on further examination they really should have gotten a test. Um, one of the things that inspired that is, is of the, well at the time he approached the commissioners, 12 exonerees most of the time the DA's office had opposed even giving them a test at some point along the line. Uh, there was one case at that point, a guy named Billy Smith, that the DA's office had successfully opposed giving him a test all the way up to the Court of Criminal Appeals. The Court of Criminal Appeals um, turned it around and said this guy should at least have a test. Um, the Court of Criminal Appeals is a court of discretionary review, so it, it's that, that, that case easily could have not even been reviewed by the Court of Criminal Appeals, but they reviewed this when they said he at least gets a test. He came back around, he got his test. He was exonerated by everybody's agreement once he got the test. So in collaboration with the Innocence Project, our biggest single tax is going back through these cases, um, reviewing the transcripts, reviewing the police reports. The students are very much involved in this. and. Um, and then meeting and reaching a consensus as to which ones of these individuals really should have at least gotten a test. Um, and in fact, um, in the year and a half since I've been there, we've had uh, three individuals who've been exonerated through DNA, uh, who were rejected the first time around uh, once, we, um, once we agreed to test and, and they got their test. Um, in addition, uh, our unit has, uh, in the appropriate case, has expedited the testing process. Um, we've agreed, for example, with the Innocence Project of, of, oh, one thing I wanted to add, in those three cases of, that we went back and looked and, and uh, um, gave the guys tests and they were exonerated, uh, in two of those cases, we identified the actual perpetrators through CODIS and otherwise. Uh, unfortunately, in each instance, the statute of limitations had run and it was too late to, to prosecute them. But uh, we've also expedited the process in new claims, or new, um, well, new claims of innocence where the inmate is asking for a DNA test. Um, in uh, one case with, with uh, the New York Innocence Project, a, a guy named Thomas McGowan, uh, 
New York approached us with, uh, with looking into his case, I guess, in September of 07. And it, it looked like a good one for testing. He had not made a previous request for a test, but it, it was for a case from way back in the 80s, as most of them are. And so we did not require them to file a formal Chapter 64 motion, which is the post-conviction DNA statute. We, uh, and, and with all the delays, et cetera, that that usually entails, but agreed to testing through a written agreement with all the disclaimers. And a long story short, from September of 07 until, well, he was exonerated in August of 07. Uh, so I guess in about seven months, so a process that usually takes years and years um, through, um, through an agreement with the Innocence Project and through cooperation, we were able to exonerate an innocent person in seven months. And Thomas McGowan was serving two life sentences that had been stacked for a single offense. A single offense, it was a home invasion. It was a horrible offense, home invasion. Uh, sexual assault. He went to trial twice, pled not guilty twice, uh, was convicted by two different juries on basically the same evidence twice and received two stacked life sentences. He walked out in, in April of 07. By May of 07, through CODIS, we had identified the actual perpetrator. Um, and uh, he was in prison for having committed a very similar brutal sexual assault after the time that Mr. McGowan had been falsely convicted of his. Um, our investigator and uh, an investigator from the Richardson Police Department, as a matter of fact, I think he's here. Um, Detective Corley, right? Uh, went out and interviewed the individual whose DNA CODIS said it belonged to. And like I said, he was in prison for a very similar brutal aggravated sexual assault. Uh, he'd actually pled to that one and got a 30-year sentence. And it actually paroled out at one point. It got sent back for a bank robbery. Um, anyway, Detective Corley and Jim Hammond for our office went out and interviewed him in prison and got, eventually, got a uh, um, confession on tape with details that only he would know. And uh, I think that that went a long way toward um, relieving some of the concerns of the victim in that case. Would you say so, Detective? Um, so that's what we're doing. Uh, I, I, um, my attitude towards testing is uh, if the test might possibly exonerate or, or would exonerate the defendant if it comes back excluding him, then obviously we'll, we'll agree to testing. Um, but more than that, if there's a possibility that a test will identify additional perpetrators in a multiple perpetrator crime where, there, where only one perpetrator was ever actually identified, I have no problem with testing. Um, and really, I have no problem testing um, if at worst what it will do is confirm the convicted person's guilt. Um, I, I think that all goes to the integrity of the system. Um, in going, through, uh, in going through all these cases, all these old cases that were originally rejected for testing, um, I think the value of getting people like Michelle Moore with the Public Defender's Office and, and organizations like the Innocence Project of Texas involved in that decision-making process is if we reach a consensus that a particular case is not meritorious and does not deserve testing, and that's really most of them. I mean, these have all been gone through once, and most of them, even on a second look, um, we all agree don't um, merit testing. But if we reach that consensus with the Public Defender's Office and the Innocence Project, then I consider that case properly vetted, uh, much more so than if it was just strictly an internal district attorney's office audit of those cases. So that's what we're doing. I don't think there's any, any other place in the country that's doing anything exactly like that. And uh, I'll uh, be around until tomorrow afternoon. If anybody has any further questions, I guess I'll be around for another few minutes.
David? Let me just uh, start the discussion on that, just uh, uh, in short response. Um, uh, I, I, you're right, you put your finger on what may be the most difficult issue, and that is where the uh, test results um, may not uh, uh, pr prove actual innocence. Um, uh, I hope we can put aside the questions, first of all, technology. We, not, we, not, we now got the technology to test all kinds of things we couldn't test before, sweat, hair, so on and so forth, so it's a, it's a much more open field. One would hope we could put aside this uh, argument that, well, the evidence was so overwhelming and there was a confession, it was a guilty plea, uh, there's no reason to test. Uh, we've learned so much by the exonerations that in over 20% of the cases, in fact, there were confessions. Uh, and we had innocent people who confessed. So uh, I hope we're not put off by the fact that, or the argument that it's, um, uh, the, the case was so strong. The, the point I think you're trying to raise here is, uh, can there be another explanation for the exclusion? Uh, maybe someone else, Seaman, was there, and maybe this was someone who was a co-conspirator. Um, uh, I guess my response to that is, is in large part, if we would test pretrial, uh, if a prosecutor, a police department would say, we've got some relevant evidence here, um, maybe it doesn't prove guilt, maybe it doesn't prove innocence, uh, but in combination with other things, it might. Uh, and if we do that pretrial, I don't see a real good reason for not doing it post-trial. If it doesn't prove innocence, that you can debate in court. But just to get access to what may be uh, the defining evidence, uh, I think we ought to lean on the side of more access rather than less. Hi, my name is Jules Epstein. I'll be one of the presenters tomorrow. Um, and I hear your question, but I suggest it's a question that comes up at two different phrase, phases, and I'm following up on what David said. The question, Mr. Hunt, I suggest should not be asked at the point of the decision to test. The harder question is, let's test, and I think let's test smartly, which is A, is it this defendant's DNA? B, if it's not, let's do a, an endis check and see whose it is. Then when we have those two pieces of datum, then ask the tougher question, big picture, what does it mean? I think right now when we put those, all those questions at the front end, we're denying reasonable investigations that could, when we take a step back, say maybe in a particular case it doesn't mean diddly. Maybe in a Ronald Cotton case, besides the fact that's easy, it's single source, but it also led us to a Bobby Poole who had a record of doing X. It causes further re-examination. So I hear your question. I think analytically it's a two-stage one, not a one-stage one. Yeah, and that is actually in the the Osborne opinion, the Ninth Circuit talks about the different approaches the circuits have taken. Some want to conflate the two steps in the process. The Osborne court chose to separate them to let the appellant develop a record based upon the testing and then go to step two saying that the prosecutor jumped the gun by wanting to conflate the two issues, put them together and say before we test, is it going to make a difference anyway? So I understand what you're saying. Again, I'm not necessarily talking about those easy cases, but when we get into issues of epithelial cells and hairs, given the sensitivity of the evidence and the realistic possibility of transferability, which we hear about on cross-examination from the defense attorneys at trial, then we're in a position to say later, you know, these are real possibilities in the post-conviction process. Yes. I'm Rhonda Saunders from the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, and I have a question for Mr. Dow. You mentioned during your review process that uh, 30,000 cases have come across your desk, and out of those, 8,000 have actually been taken on. Or do you want to clarify that? Because the question that I have is, of those cases that you've taken on, with that number, how many of those cases did the court agree that there should be testing, and out of those cases that were tested, uh, how many of those cases were exonerated or not exonerated? I'm sorry if I wasn't clear with, with the numbers. Um, over 30,000 cases have come through our office. The 8,000 numbers, cases that are still in some sort of evaluation. Um, as far as how many clients we've actually represented, that's just over 1,100, and even some of those weren't really represented. They just were considered clients before we actually got to a litigation phase. Um, as far as our numbers, um, hold on, I think I have them here. We've done an uh, internal study on cases over the last five years. This is uh, clients that were closed between 2004 and 2008. 
Um, 97 of them went to testing, and uh, 41 exclusions, 41 inclusions, and uh, a little over 14% either had results that weren't probative, for example, matched a, a consensual partner, for example, or got no results at all because there was uh, not enough uh, material there to test. Thank you. Barry? Uh, Barry Fisher, LA County Sheriff. Um, I love to hear what you're saying because it's the uh, uh, Crime Lab Full Employment Act. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it would be truly wonderful if we could test everything. Uh, there are some technologies out there that are simply exquisite. There's touch DNA, there's low copy number DNA, the Brits are really pushing the, the envelope. In the United States, there's a few labs that are also doing this. Most labs are struggling just to stay on top of the cases that are coming in the door, the very, uh, the, the, the high watt cases, if, if you will. Uh, some labs to manage backlogs are arbitrarily saying, we're only going to test two samples, three samples, four samples in a rape or murder case. So if there is a desire and a demand to do all of this additional testing, somebody has to figure out a way of paying for this testing. Another issue is that in some of these newer technologies, if we are presenting this kind of evidence in a trial, I can assure you that the defense bar is going to be jumping up and down, arguing Daubert or Fry that this stuff really isn't, hasn't reached prime time. Uh, if that's the case, you can't turn it around and start introducing uh, this kind of technology in post-conviction uh, testing. So uh, th there has got to be a lot more dialogue and discussion about how far we can, we can actually go, and we, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves in trying and trying and expecting more than the public laboratories are able to give without uh, funding them at a level to do it. Did I address that issue? I guess that was addressed to me. Um, almost all of the testing that we are doing through, and really all the testing we're doing through the review process is being done by a private laboratory and is being funded by grant money. Hi, I'm John Fye with the Arizona Attorney General's Office, and my question is to Mr. Ware. Uh, how come with these 400 applications uh, you didn't just go ahead and test them all, and, and why did the McGowan case take seven months to get through the system? You mean as opposed to years and years, or as opposed to seven weeks, or what? I mean as opposed to seven weeks or two months. Uh, in other words, I'm asking, you know, what, what are the reasons for not testing the 400, and what is the delay in the Texas process for you know, if there's a person actually innocent in prison, we want them out as soon as possible. You know, uh, first off, on the, on the McGowan case, I mean, the first time we heard the name was in September, so we had to locate the evidence. I mean, the case, the conviction was back in the 1980s, so we had to locate the evidence. We had to transfer the evidence. We had to satisfy ourselves from the record and otherwise that this was, in fact, an appropriate case for testing. And then we had to get the test results. And then we had to get into court and, uh, and get it done. Um, in contrast, the first exoneration after Mr. Watkins took office was January the 11th of 2007. An individual named Fuller, that was an exoneration ultimately an agreed exoneration, but he applied for testing back in 2001. So that was a six-year process. Um, as far as why we don't test all 400, or actually it's closer to 500 cases, um, well, the answer in some of them is easy. In some of them, there's nothing there to test. Um, either it, it, maybe it was a drive-by shooting. You know, and it's just a frivolous claim. They want us to DNA test the bullets. You get, you get, you get some of those. 
we get a lot of jail mail. Um, so there's some where there's just nothing there to test. There's some that are patently frivolous. Um, so uh, there, there's a number of reasons why. And, and, and once again, that's why we brought the Innocence Project in on, one reason we brought the Innocence Project in on this, aside from the fact that they perform valuable work, when they agree with us that it is a case that doesn't merit testing, then we believe that it has been properly vetted. Okay. Last question or comment? Uh, yes. I'm uh, Elliot Coleman, uh, director of the Maine State Police Crime Laboratory. And from a, an analyst viewpoint, if it's a, a visible biological stain, there generally is no concern. In the case of trace DNA, touch DNA, you're looking at something that to actually tie it to a crime is very difficult. All DNA actually does is put someone at a scene. However, in this whole room, if a crime were committed, virtually everyone's DNA would be present. Would that be enough then for an exoneration for post-conviction? And even if you can find that DNA, as one gentleman brought up, why isn't it tested to find out whose DNA is it? Well, even then, you're only looking at a convicted offender database, which is totally, you know, is not com completely filled as, as it is. But what about people who aren't currently convicted? Suddenly, now you ha have to approach the idea of testing every person within the United States, which becomes another problem. So looking at DNA as the end all for post-conviction testing is really kind of a short-sighted uh, uh, view of this of the, the 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 science and i would just agree with you i think you have to take a number of factors <laughs> into account uh, prosecutors will relate to this we have to take dna as one item of evidence in the context of the entirety of the case and does it fit or not and i think we have to do that i know in the media, if you hear about an exclusion automatically, it's assumed to be an exoneration. We who work with this stuff on a daily basis, given the sensitivity of the technology, know that's not true. It's a very difficult issue, and I just don't want to broad brush this as a very easy issue, and I don't think anyone here believes that, but I know that that is a perception. So that's something that I'm terribly interested in is evidentiary context and the value will rise or fall depending on many factors and circumstances and every case has to be exhaustively analyzed to make sure that we get the right result which we all in the end want. So our time is up. Thanks for your participation. We'll move on to the lunch program.